Hello, and welcome to History and Anthropology, the life and death of visual literacy. My name is Jared Bendis, creative director of the New Media Studio, and with me, conspicuously silent, is Dr. Mace Mensch, faculty support manager, and we're both at Case Western Reserve University. Well, what is visual literacy? Well, basically, visual literacy means understanding what we see and integrating the visual stimuli with our other senses. This would include such things as visual actions, objects, and symbols. By using these skills, we can communicate with others and understand and appreciate such things as the great visual masterpieces. As more and more emphasis is being placed on new media and less on written media, it becomes imperative that we learn how to interpret what we see and to be able to think critically about it. Two areas of interest when looking at visual literacy are the effects of history and culture on our ability to interpret visual representation. Several years ago, Herman Maurer from the Graz University of Technology keynoted at a language conference where he asked the very controversial question, do we need written language at all? He further went on to ask the question, will written language more or less disappear in the next 50 years? You can imagine how controversial this was for the audience. And while I think he was a bit extreme in his views, I think the question is valid because we are leaning away from written language. This presentation is just some of our favorite examples and isn't meant to be a definitive anything. I also want to take a moment to apologize for the myriad of mispronunciations that I'm bound to encounter. Let's start out in Egypt, where art revealed detail and consistency in human life. Or in Oriental art, which reveals harmony of positive and negative philosophical elements. Or the art of the ancient Greeks, which views the human body as a medium for balance, harmony, and rationality. Western art address particular aspects of time and space. What it all boils down to is context. You have to be who you are, where you are, and when you are, and play to that audience. For instance, what makes Vermeer Vermeer? The painting on the left is Girl with Pearl Earring from 1665. The painting on the right is Christ and the Disciples from 1936. The painting on the left is Vermeer. The painting on the right is Han von Meegren. The problem is, the painting on the right was introduced into the collection as a Vermeer. Han von Meegren was a famous Vermeer forger. So the question is, if von Meegren, a failed artist, is successful as a Vermeer forger, why isn't he a successful artist? The problem also go back to context. Vermeer is Vermeer in 1665. That's that sensibilities, that's that time, that's that place. Von Meegren can't go back to that time. He can't go back. Maybe he would have been famous then, but he's definitely not famous now. One of the funnier aspects of this is that shortly after World War II, Von Meegren was arrested because one of his fake Vermeers ended up in the collection of Hermann Goring, and it's illegal to sell national treasures to the enemy. He then came out and insisted that it was a forgery. They've been forging Vermeers. No one believed him because they said he was a bad artist. So while in prison, he agreed to prove it and forge another Vermeer. Of course, at that point, they arrested him for forgery, and he died later in prison. But the point really goes back to the fact that it's all about context. Who you are, when you are, who you're talking to. Can you really imagine a world before perspective? Can you think about it? We all grew up. We all saw pictures. We all tried to draw in 3D at some point. We draw our pencils. We tried to learn it all. We tried to figure it out ourselves. But think about it. For the longest time, the world existed without perspective. People drew flat things. Foreshortening didn't exist. All these things, it went undiscovered. The question isn't people didn't know how to draw things. The question becomes... Did they view the world differently? Did people think about things differently? What would have happened if back then somebody were to see one of our modern images? Would they even understand it? Are the sensibilities different today? It's a very, very difficult question because the next question becomes, will the sensibilities be different tomorrow? And then, in the early 1400s, Filippo Brunelleschi invents linear perspective. Can't imagine that, inventing linear perspective. And he does it in the most ingenious way. He has a panel with a peephole in it, pointing at a building. And he paints on that panel, exactly using all the new rules, all the new inventions that he's come up with, the mathematics. He figures out linear perspective. And when you look through the peephole, you see the building. And when you hold a mirror up in front of the peephole, you can actually see what he's drawn. And it allows you to compare because you move the mirror away and you can transition between the painting and the actual object. And you can see 
that he's done it correctly. And it's a great device, and it's amazing. But he invents it. He invents linear perspective. And a revolution occurs. In 1426, Masaccio paints Trinity. This is the earliest painting we have that uses perspective. They say that Masaccio consulted with Brunelleschi on this painting. There is a distinct grid work. Everything goes to that one point, and it's designed for the perfect interpretation. And it's amazing because you start seeing this intersection of the way the world really is, the way that we see the world, mathematics, art. It's a merging of things, and you can start seeing that the world is going to get a lot more complex pretty fast. And everybody scrambles to learn it. Everybody wants to know this thing about linear perspective. People go to study with other people. And Alberti, in, in 1435, publishes a book on it. And everybody wants to do it. And they invent these devices. For instance, we have Durer's device here. And everyone's got all these crazy computational devices. When is the last time you saw one of these devices? How many people still use these devices? But these drawing aids were the only way of doing it back then. And we're not talking that long ago. We're talking 600 years ago, this is how you drew in perspective. Now people understand the systems better, but everybody back then wanted to learn it because people started to think differently. And that way of thinking has been passed along. 200 years later in Rome, at the Church of St. Ignatius, Andrea Pozzo in 1691 paints this magnificent ceiling. And instead of ceiling, seeing just a closed ceiling, what we see is an amazing optical illusion. If you stand right in the center of the room, you can see St. Ignatius being carried up to heaven on a cloud by a crowd of angels. Think about it, in 200 years, you've gone from just being able to start drawing in perspective to a complete mastery of it to be able to control exactly what you want the viewer to see and fool them in a realistic manner. But it's not just the ability to create that's important. It's also the way that we look. And I want to talk right now about the various ways of looking, for good or for bad, that will affect visual literacy. I'm a 3D enthusiast, and one of my favorite things in this world is stereoscopic images. And when you talk about stereoscopic images, you're talking about a different way of looking. At the turn of the last century, Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes described stereoscopic images as follows. He said... By means of these two different views of an object, the mind, as it were, feels around it and gets an idea of solidity. We clasp an object with our eyes, as with our arms or with our hands, or with our thumb and finger, and then we know it to be something more than a surface. This is not the casual obser observation that we know today. People, when looking at stereoscopic images, they would gaze, they would get lost in a scene, they would feel it. They would be immersed in it. And there's a, there's a skill set that goes along with that, and that skill set went away with stereoscopic images. I have another quote from another famous man, this time Leonardo da Vinci. And da Vinci talks about another way of looking. Da Vinci, in his comparison of the arts, writes, Why the picture seen with two eyes will not be an example of such relief as the relief seen with two eyes. This is because the picture seen with one eye will place itself in relief like the actual relief having the same qualities of light and shade. Da Vinci was an enthusiast of people being able to see in 3D with one eye because he was a painter. And he knew that if you close one eye and lock your gaze and don't move and you stare at a painting, the brain will take over and it will fill in the depth. And you can do this if you close one eye and you totally don't move you will see that the brain will take all the rest of the cues and will fill in and will make you feel the relief and feel the sensation of 3D. This technique is very, very old, but not everyone is aware of it. But when people were looking at images more than they are today, people were then. In 1907, Carl Zeiss constructed and patented the Synopter. And the Synopter makes what I just described a whole lot easier to do. Basically, it turns you into a cyclops. It pre presents the right eye and the left eye with the exact same image. Now, if you hold up a photograph, you think, well, don't the right eye and the left eye see the same thing? They really don't. Really, they're viewing the same thing, but slightly offset from one another. And your brain goes, aha, that's a flat picture. The synopter feeds both the right eye and the left eye two of the same image. And your brain goes, wait a second, I'm seeing two images here. I'm supposed to be seeing different things that allows me to fuse them together and achieve stereopsis. And instead, 
when it sees the same thing, the brain in its confusion says, well, I better get to work here and fills in the blanks. And you actually have the physical sensation of depth. It's an amazing phenomenon. And at the turn of the century, a variety of devices were invented for doing this type of observation. Again, it's 100 years later. You haven't seen one of these before. I can't get my hands on one. Let's take a look at the Mueller-Lyer illusion. This illusion, which was published by Franz Mueller-Lyer in 1889, it's a famous illusion. Which line is longer, the top line or the bottom line? They're both equal, though the bottom line looks longer. And there are a variety of theories about why it looks that way. Some say because the bottom line has a bigger gestalt, the area is bigger. Some say the lines lead out. But others actually point to a more anthropological answer. In 1963, a psychological study was run across cultures on a variety of illusions. And one of the discoveries of it was that Africans and Filipinos were much less susceptible than Americans to this type of an illusion. A theory goes that Americans are used to more linear construction, that we live in a more carpentered world. And because we survive in this carpentered world based on these types of angular images, we expect this type of illusion in nature. And the people who don't live in that type of world, while the illusion still works for probably the other psychological reasons, it doesn't work anywhere near as strong. And there's a cultural effect here. And that cultural effect affects the visual literacy. Another culturally affected illusion is the Ponzo illusion proposed by Mario Ponzo in 1913. It's also called the train track illusion. If we see these two lines, which one's bigger? Well, they're really the same size, but of course the top one tends to look bigger because of the effect of linear perspective. And when linear perspective comes to play, it influences the way we look at things. Probably the most fascinating study involves the Bambuti pygmies done by Turnbull in 1961. He studied them Bambuti pygmies who lived in the dense rainforest of the Congo. This is a world without open spaces. Well, he took these pygmies out into a plain with a herd of buffalo. The pygmies, they thought they were insects. They were pointed out to the buffalo because they were little. And if they were little, they had to be insects. When Turnbull told them that they weren't insects, that they were buffalo, they were insulted and they didn't believe him. So he put them in his jeep and he drove them to see the buffalo. And they, they were amazed and frightened when they began to grow into buffalo. Can you imagine living in a world where you don't ever see things far away? because there is no far away? How does that affect your sensibility? And what sensibilities are we currently lacking? What sort of world are we living in right now that we won't be in 20, 50, 100 years? Another example is face space mentioned by A.K. Dudney in an article on computer caricature. In this article, they talked about computers actually generating caricature. And they show here an example of Ronald Reagan being manipulated by a computer. And it's very interesting to see this but it really asks a question is, how does a computer know what to manipulate? The answer is, is that the computer starts out with an androgynous face, compares it to the selected face, and only morphs those things that are different. And it exaggerates those items from the norm. What's interesting here is what, what becomes the norm. This androgynous face is really just a composite of a variety of other faces. And what are those faces that come together? That androgyny is an androgyny of a culture. If we put one culture's faces in here, we get one sort of a thing. If we put another culture's faces, we get another sort of a thing. What are our internal androgynies? What are our internal buildups of experience that actually allow us to view the world? We know how we can feed this into a computer, but do we really know what our owns are? What we're looking at here is a composite of experience. In contrast to a composite of experience, we have a composite of time in this 1884 photo of George Reynolds pole vaulting. This is a different way of looking at the world. Let's take a look at the 1912 painting, Dynamism of a Dog on a Leash, by Giacomo Bala, the Italian futurist. Now, if you look at this painting today, you're, you kind of smirk and you smile and you think, ah, cartoons. This was it. This was, this was the beginning. It may seem trite now, it may seem overdone now, but this represents an amazing stage in the evolution of visual thought. To quote Scott McCloud, if you're going to paint a world filled with motion, then you have to be prepared to paint motion. And this is the start of something new. Also from 1912, we have Marcel Duchamp's new Descending a Staircase number 2. In this case, we see multiple views, not just that blurred motion. To quote again Scott McCloud, Somewhere between the futurist dynamic movement and Duchamp's diagrammatic concept of movement 
Lies Comics Motion Line. Motion lines or speed lines are fascinating things because true motion only exists in the physical world. Motion in visual images is always an illusion. So speed lines are used to the indicate this motion. An example with this speed would be the roadrunner leaving in a puff of dust. Beep, beep. There are a variety of type of speed lines. Here we see four different types. We have the simple speed line. We have the, the blur made by the object. We have after images made by the object. Or we have the background in blur. These are four different types. And the question is, is this just a phenomenon of our culture? Different cultures use different types of speed lines, but they exist. They've been found in 11th century Japanese drawings. They've been found in sketches by Leonardo da Vinci. And there's evidence that both true motion in the real world and motion depicted by speed lines stimulate the same regions of the brain. Now I want to talk about the fight between text and images. You see, in the beginning, there were images. And images evolved into symbols. And symbols became letters, and letters became words. And the words, they separated themselves from the images. And the text became something unique unto itself. And we saw less and less images. And we relied on the words. But now our reliance is shifting again. And it's going back towards the images. And as we come to rely more and more on non-text things, we have to ask ourselves, what is immersion? Morton Helig, in an article called Cinema of the Future from 1955, breaks down the importance of the senses as follows. He said that sight is 70%, hearing is 20%, smell is 5%, touch is 4%, and taste is 1%. And I'm going to quote Da Vinci again and talk about how important da Vinci believed that sight was. He wrote, The eye deludes itself less than any of the other senses because it sees by none other than that straight lines which compose a pyramid, the base of which is the object, and the lines conduct the object to the eye, as I intend to show. But the ear is strongly subject to delusions about lo the location and the distance of its object because the images of sound do not reach it in straight lines, like those of the eye, but by tortuous and reflexive lines. Many times things that are remote sound closer than those nearby, on account of the way the images are transmitted, although the sound of the echo is referred to the ear only by means of straight lines. The sense of smell is even less able to locate the source of the odor. Taste and touch, which come into contact with the objects, can only gain knowledge from direct contact. How important is sight? Well, let me take you back. Let me take you to 1895 on December 28th, the first public showing of cinematography by the Lumiere brothers. Here we have the arrival of a train in the station. When audiences saw this, they shrieked. It says it caused a panic as a train pulled towards them. Is that true? I don't know. But can you imagine a world without perspective? If you can imagine a world without perspective, then it's no great leap to imagine that when people first saw film, that they didn't know what they were seeing, that the sensation wasn't desensitized yet, that this was enough to actually cause the panic. But whether that's true or not, I want to quote novelist Maxim Gorky, who wrote, If one could only convey the strangeness of this world, a world without color and sound, Everything here, the earth, water, and air, the trees, the people, everything is made of a monotone gray. Gray rays of sunlight in a gray sky, gray eyes in a gray face, leaves as gray as cinder, not life but shadow of life, not life's movement but a sort of mute specter. Here I must try to explain myself before the reader thinks I've gone mad or become too indulgent towards symbolism. I was at Aumont's restaurant and I saw the Lumiere cinematography, the moving pictures. The spectacle creates an impression so complex that I doubt I'm able to describe all its nuances. For the next 50 or so years, there was a quest to make movies more and more immersive. In the 1950s, we saw everything kind of come together, every type of gimmick known to man. Cinerama had three cameras and three projectors to get a full visual surround. We had smell vision We had sense around, which was the vibrating seats. We had Percepto with the shocking seats. We had Ghost Vision. and We had my favorite, 3D. But then it all died. You know why it died? All hail CinemaScope and the end of chaos. And really, what solves all these problems is the anamorphic lens. And we're able to squeeze a widescreen image onto a very small piece of film. And what people really want is a very large visual image. And that large visual image is enough to make everybody go, that, get rid of the rest of that stuff. 
And if you think about it, that was 50 years ago. And in 50 years, this is pretty much what's been the way. Widescreen imagery is more important than anything else because it's that large field of view. It's that visual sense that we want. It's that visuals that really feed most of what we need. So I want to ask the question, what will kill the movies? Well, TV didn't kill the movies. We, TV, TV's been around. The movie's been around. Games haven't killed the movies. Virtual reality really hasn't really... It's, phys, it's killed itself more than anything else. If anything's killed the movies, it's been home theater. The lower attendance has really been blamed on the fact that people want to see them at home. But that's really moving the location, not killing the medium. How do you kill a medium? People say you can't kill a medium. They can't imagine it. Imagine the world's most popular medium. Imagine something that's a staple of modern imagery just vanishing, completely vanishing. And if you sit there and think about it for a second, I want to remind you about stereoscopic images. Because at the turn of the last century, there were more stereoscopic views than there were 2D views. It was the most popular way of looking at the world. And it's gone. It's a subculture now. You don't have a stereopticon, but everybody had a stereopticon. Not only did everyone have a stereopticon, everyone had stereo views of their farm, of their house, of what was interesting to them. So what killed it? Well, what killed it was two things. First of all, the car killed it. The car killed a lot of medium. If you can go and see something, you don't need a picture of it. I don't need to see Niagara Falls. I can drive to Niagara Falls. Being able to get around changes the nature of the world because you can actually get first-hand experiences. The other is movies. People like to go to the movies. And movies emerge on the scene right around the time that stereoscopic images die. Because in some way, the moving image trumps the 3D image. The movie, the moving image is more immersive. It's also easier to view. That whole idea of how you view, no one tells you how to view a movie. But it's important to start seeing about these things because could it happen again? If I told you that TV would go away or the movies would go away, Trump for some other thing, could it happen again? It could happen again if there were some new perceptual revolution. You know what that revolution is? Well, I'm not a futurist, so your guess is as good as mine. But I bet it'll happen. I bet it could happen. I want to give you an example of how powerful a perceptual revolution can be. How powerful is perception? We've all seen this. This is the Olympic flag. You see five rings of different colors. But the Olympic flag is very carefully designed for weight and balance. And what a lot of people don't know, and what I only learned not too long ago, is that those rings aren't all the same size. If you view the width of all of these rings as unit one, the black ring is at 0.92, and the yellow ring is 1.3, because colors have different weights. And by making the black line thinner and the yellow line thicker, they would all appear to be the same size. That's how important these rules of perception are. That's how important our modern sensibilities are. I want to give you another example here. And this example deals with depth perception, which is another fun topic I like to talk about. And this is an excerpt from a talk that I give to psychology and art students about how you view the world around you. What is important? What are the monocular cues of depth perception? Basically, how you look at images. I'm just going to quickly go through a few of them. For instance, we talk about familiar size, that size is important, that basically what you know about an object will allow you to color how you see an object. We talk about relative size, you know, how big an object is will reflect where it is in space. We talk about overlap and interp interposition, the things that occlude other things tend to be in front of them. We talk about linear perspective, that we expect to see lines going back into space going back into space, that if they came to come together, that we push them back into space. We talk about texture gradient. Students love this one because when you tell them that you only see details of something that's close up. If you can see texture, your brain says it's near. We talk about atmospheric perspective, the bluish tint of the mountains, the hazy tint of things far away. We talk about aerial perspective. This is another really fun one. The higher something is in a picture, the further we assume it is away from us. These are things we're trained to know. Shadows and shading, the way that light seems to wrap around an object to give it its form. The way in relative brightness that things that are darker get pushed back into space. We actually can see layers and levels of things. So how do we go about perpetuating this visual literacy? What is the content that authors need to know that the public's already programmed for? And what we're talking about here is elements of design. We're talking about things like grouping and relationships, the field, lines, implied lines, 
edlines, structure. We're talking about things like monumental scale, intimate scale, positive shape, negative shape, geometric shape, organic shape, weight, movement, tension, hue, value, intensity, temperature, reflection, balance, symmetry, asymmetry, rhythm, curve, repetition, variation, harmony. I could go on, but I won't. Suffice to say that the rules of design, the rules of modern design, the rules that are innately programmed into the people around you are out there to be learned if you only want to go out there and study them. I want to come to my conclusion now and say the world bombards us with images. Sometimes we're the author, sometimes we're the viewer. And we need to be aware of the historical, anthropological, cultural, and psychological factors that go into it all on both sides of the fence. Thank you. If you'd like to reach me, I'm Jared.Bendis at case.edu, and with me, silently as always, is Mace.Mensch at case.edu.